All righty then. One second, guys. <clears throat> All righty then. Okay, how you guys doing? Let's begin. Yeah, I'm Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. <clears throat> May the Holy Spirit strengthen my throat, <clears throat> cleanse and heal my throat, my lungs, my heart, my arteries, my chest. And grant me the discipline to stay healthy and fit. And may the Holy Spirit perfect my recall of every jot, tittle portion of Scripture. Save me from error. Correct me on the spot. May the Holy Spirit be our self-control, our self-restraint, our self-constraint to control our passions. We're not controlled by them. <clears throat> For the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, may the Holy Spirit destroy all distractions. May he guide this conversation, convict this man, bring him to the feet of Jesus Christ, rebuke Satan, rebuke demons. May we be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> purified, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit beatify us with the beauty of Jesus Christ. Do that for our loved ones, my daughters, even their mother. Seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ, to be politically incorrect, to be holy and righteous and pure, to perfect the gifts that delight our God, <clears throat> these gifts in us, perfect faith in our God, hope in our God, perfect love for our God and love for one another. By the power of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> be my... <clears throat> Be my strength, Holy Spirit. Strengthen us. May I be your mouthpiece, Holy Spirit. You're the teacher. Bring this man back to the feet of Jesus Christ. Bless the internet connection, the audiovisual qualities. Strengthen my throat with the health I need to glorify Jesus Christ. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. Rebuke Satan and demons. <clears throat> in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. All right. He's here. My friend is here. How you doing, my friend, old buddy, old pal? We can't hear you. Please make sure your mic is working. Go in. You there? I can't hear him. Can you guys hear him? <clears throat> Does anyone hear him? No. You may have to come on your phone again, I guess, or computer not working. Thank you, Thomas. But you're a brother in Christ. Saying I'm handsome doesn't do much for me. All right. Cohen, we can't hear you. He's from the Netherlands. He's a convert to Islam. So we're waiting. Pray in Jesus' name his mic works. Please, Lord Jesus, let his mic work. <clears throat> and empower me by the Spirit to bring him to your feet. For your glory, almighty Son of God. Rebuke Satan, Lord to the Father, the Spirit. Cohen, we can't hear you, sir. Go on your phone, I guess. Fix it, buddy. So I'm just making sure he's kosher. As I spoke to him. He says he's from the Netherlands. What's up, Anila, full armor? What language do they speak? Netherlands. He'll be on, just wait. He's coming on. <clears throat> he's a convert. Are you guys also in Netherlands? What's the language in Netherlands? Come on, kitty. Kitty, I love you, kitty. Pray I recover. Pray for me. <clears throat> Perfect health, get healthier, get holier, and glorify Jesus Christ. Netherlands. Hold on. All right. Jennifer, this young, beautiful princess from the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus preserve all our sisters, <clears throat> protect them from wolves, and protect us men from Jezebels in Jesus' name. Protect us. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. So, Jennifer, you can watch on Facebook or you can come on YouTube. You are from Netherlands, Deutsch. Everyone's from Netherlands, they they speak Deutsch. Deutsch, Gert, 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 Gert. We're waiting. He's gonna fix his mic. So I got another session later on. We may open up to Q and A. As you can see, I'm getting old, and at times <clears throat> my throat wears out. Ask the Lord to strengthen my throat and my sight. Use my sight for purity, to read the Word, and my throat to glorify Jesus Christ. Netherlands. Gert, 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 Gert. <clears throat> Did you see that incense cloud appearing? Thanks to Jerby for uploading. He sent me three more. <clears throat> so these are not gnats, light reflection. These are not spit, spittle. And they appear on different computers in different places. I was at a hotel and it happened. So, Unknown, where is your mother located in the States? Does she want to know? Because they want to do muta with her. Contact me on Skype. Give me your location. I'll pay you a visit. 
We're just waiting for him. He said, take it easy. Take. He's working on it. I know. Where does your mother live? Does she I want to know? And I want to send them her, her way. And contact me so you can tell me where you're at. I'll come visit you. <clears throat> We're waiting. He's working on his mic. I'll say, what's up, man? I'll say with an H. Gordon Verdon, Muslim Revert, we know you're on. Your microphone is not working. Can you work on your microphone, sir? All right. Tony Wodaki, Aziza. No, you're not backstage, Cohen. You're in front. Your mic is not working, Cohen. We have you in the front, mister. Here, one more time. You there? We're waiting for you to use your mic, sir. You're not backstage. You're here. I see you. Oh, yeah, okay, hold on. He's coming back on again. Hey, Jesus, son of God. How are you, man? You doing okay? We're waking. He's a revert <clears throat> in the Netherlands. Dachi Tony Agamini. Netherlands. Woo! I'm recovering from my cheat days. Pray I get back. Okay, let's see. Okay. Well, how's your mic now? I'm, I think it works now. Yes, it's working, sir. Speak. Say more Hello? than that. Yes, yes. Why are you screaming? Take it easy. You there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good, good, good. Are you sure you're situated? You can talk and you're not driving? I'm well. I'm right? Yeah. Okay, good. So you're good. Okay, so you're from Netherlands. Exactly. Netherlands. You call yourself Muslim Reford. Your name is Cohen. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> how long have you been a Muslim? 11 months. Yes, and what was your background? <clears throat> I uh, came from Christianity to Islam. What kind of Christianity? I, I, I'm not really sure what it was. Okay, so you didn't know much. That's fine. Okay, so you were pretty much a nominal Christian then, right? Not a devout one. Yeah. Okay, so what version of Islam did you embrace? The Sunni Islam. Okay, so you became, even Sunni Islam, you have Ashari and Salafi. What did you become? The Salafi. Okay, so then, did they teach you what you believe about Allah? Yeah. That you believe Allah has two right hands, a foot, a shin, gonads, eyes, and he's above the arsh. And these are actual sifat of Allah, unlike anything in creation? He's actually unlike creation. Yeah, so you believe that. So he has two right hands? Two of the right hands, yeah. And so can I ask you a question? Those attributes of Allah, they're uncreated, right? <clears throat> yeah. So that means these attributes, what we call body parts, you don't like to call body parts because that's the brainwashing. They're uncreated. That means Allah has always existed with these attributes, that means he's always existed with a shape and a form. Now, logically, because you guys talk about being logical, Allahu Alam. Logically, if you have a shape, you need space to dwell in. So do you believe Allah is the creator of all things? He's the creator of all things. No. He didn't create his hands, his feet, his shin, or the space that he occupies to dwell. Because if you have a shape, you need space to dwell in. So he didn't create that, did he? <clears throat> Think logically, because you're smart. You're not uneducated. You came from the Netherlands, you're educated. So think with me. So he didn't create all space. Because the space that his hands and his foot and his gonads need cannot be created. Okay. So he's not the creator of all things. I mean, he's not um, like um, creation. No, I didn't say he's creation. Cohen, listen to me carefully, which they did not teach you. And in Jesus' name, may he bless your mic, because I want you to listen. So guys, put up with the distraction, because this guy just became a Muslim, not knowing Christianity too much. When you tell me Allah has two right hands, even though they're unlike anything, they're still really right hands. And he still really has eyes, and he really has a shin. Well, 
anything that has <clears throat> hands and feet is a shape, a body of some kind, and a shape, a form needs space. So if these are uncreated, then the space that Allah dwells in must be uncreated. So Allah could not have created the space that he occupies. Think logically, because you tell me it's not rational. So this shape has to be of some size. How big is this shape? Because that means the space must be bigger to, to contain him. So you didn't think about these things when they deceived you into becoming Muslim, right? Maybe. Right, Cole? Yeah, maybe. Okay, secondly, the Quran is a speech of Allah, right? Yes. Kalam Allah. It's not Allah, is it? No. But it's uncreated, right? It's probably his attributes. Yeah, so the Quran is Kalam Allah. It's uncreated, so it has no beginning, correct? Yes, no beginning. The Quran, right? The, the Quran has no beginning. Yeah, speak clearly in the mic. Just get, get closer to the mic and relax because we're going to walk through you. So the Quran is not Allah, right? No, it's not. So Allah's uncreated, right? Yes. And the Quran is uncreated? Yes. It's Do your math. How many is that? What did you Do your math. Allah is uncreated. Quran is uncreated. You said Quran is not Allah. You got two uncreated things, huh? I mean, the Quran is part of Allah's attributes. Oh, so the Quran, not Allah, but it's part of Allah, so it can still be one, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. You didn't think about your religion. You left Christianity that you do not know for an Islam that you do not know. It's sad, but that's okay. Hopefully God will open your heart. That's why you're here. I'm hoping the Lord will bring you. So you're okay with the Quran being the word of Allah that became a book, right? It was spoken into a book, yeah. Well, it wasn't simply spoken. The Arabic Quran is the Quran. When you open up the Kitab, the Mus'haf, because yeah. Allah, your God, Allah says to Muhammad, we sent down to you the book. 548, Kitab. The Mus'haf, the Kitab, that book is the Quran if it's Arabic, right? Yeah. So you believe Allah's word became a book. So what's your problem with Christians saying God's eternal word became man? <clears throat> because. Because what? <clears throat> because my, my, our God cannot be my contained. Oh, but your God is contained because you just said he has hands and a foot. That means he's contained in space. Are you listening? His form is not unknown. His form is what? His form is what? His form is unknown. But oh, but what a cheap him. excuse. Allahu Alam. That doesn't solve your problem. He still has a form. Form requires space. So your God is contained because you believe he's above the throne. Al -al -arsh. How can he be above anything if he's not a shape that has space? Can you explain that to me? Your God is contained. And the Quran is Allah's speech, right? Yeah. And yet it's contained between two covers, Mus'haf. So what do you mean? The message came later. Well, the, the Quran has always existed even before it was revealed. You're confusing its revelation with its existence. So the Quran wasn't there before creation? I mean, our speech definitely is eternal. But the Quran is a speech. Don't make that distinction or you're going to be a kafir. The Quran is his speech. It's not simply a revelation of a speech. So... The Quran has always existed. Not as a book. It became a book. That's why that's what I was telling you. If the speech that is uncreated can become a book, why can't the word of God become flesh? You didn't answer that question. Because Allah doesn't need to become a human. Okay, but Allah doesn't need to become a book, but he became a book according to you. 
uh, for guidance. Oh, so you admit Allah became a book for guidance. Good. Book into existence. Buddy, you're not listening, Cohen. Listen to yourself. Maybe if you listen, you'll see how you just contradict yourself. So Allah can become a book for guidance, but he can't become man because he can't be contained. But Allah has a body that he's contained with or by. Are you listening to yourself? Yeah. Okay, so you're okay with your God having a shape and form that contains him that's uncreated? So your God is contained. I'm still waiting for you to solve that dilemma for me. I mean, he is omnipresent. No, he's not. Not according to Salafi Islam. It says he is present by his knowledge. So you're a bad Salafi if you say that because now you're an Ashari. So I thought you said you're Salafi. Maybe. So you don't know what you are? <laughs> okay, that's fine, man. Because you've only been, they deceived you. So how come Allah has two right hands? He doesn't have a left one? <clears throat> huh? It means that he has the right hands. He's what? He, in order, another hadith narrates that he has... Speak clearly left. in the mic. Another hadith says what? That he has left hand. Well, now he's got two right hands and a left hand. So that means he got three hands. That's a grotesque monster. Me. He has two of the right hands. Two of what? Hands. Two what again? Two of the good hands. Two good hands? Two good hands, yeah. Okay, so you're saying left hand is bad? Mm, that's not what I said. Okay, so, but the Hadith says he has two right hands. It's not my legit right hands. They're not legit, so they're fake? They're illegitimate? I mean, I mean, Allah is definitely outside of creation. No, he's not. If he has a shape and a form, that means he needs to be contained in space. So you're saying that space is uncreated? Okay, so that means Allah and something else is uncreated. So I'm still trying to figure out your, your God. So does Allah have a left hand or not? Mm, uh, it says in another hadith that he, held, he holds things in, a, in his left hand. No, it doesn't say left hand. It says he holds in the right hand and he holds in his hand. So the hadith you're referring to. But I know there's a hadith that says he has a left hand, but it says he has two right hands. Here. Here it is. I'm putting. I'm going to put the hadith on the screen. I just sent it to you in private chat. This is from Sunan Nasai. It's great Sahih. Here it is. This is from Sunnah.com. So here you go. So let me show it to you. So that means Allah has three hands, two right and one left. Here, let me show it to you. It was narrated by Abdullah bin Amr bin Al-As, the ass, that the Prophet, right here, right yeah. here, we put it on screen. It was narrated from Abdullah ibn Amr bin Al-As, the ass, the Prophet said, those who are just and fair will be with Allah, most high on thrones of light, at the right hand of the most merciful, those who are just in their rulings and in their dealings with their families, and those of whom they are in charge, Muhammad, one of the narrators, said in his hadith, and both his hands are right hands. Sahih. Yeah. Okay, so here it says right hands. Now, here's the one. Now, this is the one you're talking about, that he places something in his right hand and left hand. Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim. This one you're referring to. There are other narrations says he puts it in his right hand, and he puts other things in the other hand. But this one... Says left. Okay, we'll go with this one. Sahih Muslim, book 39, number 6704. Here you go. So if he has, if both his hands are right, but then he has a left one, that means he has three hands. Abdullah bin Omar reported Allah's messenger saying, Allah, the exalted and glorious, would fold the heavens on the day of judgment. Then he would place them on his right hand. This is what you're referring to. And say, I am the Lord. Where are the haughty and where are the proud? He would fold the earth, placing it on the left hand, and say, I am the Lord, where are the haughty and where are the proud today? So this is what you're referring to. Other nations will not, will not say left hand, but that's okay. This one does. So I'm asking you, 
If he has two right hands, but then he has a left one, that's three hands. So yes, that's why Allah is unlike anything creation. Because this is a grotesque looking monster. How many creations you see? Two right hands and a left one. But your God is a grotesque looking monster. You okay with this? Mm. In the Quran it says he is independent of all the worlds. Not independent of his body parts though. He's not to be described as having a form, body, limits, directions, and material existence. He doesn't what? Particular space or location. Yes, he does. He's above the throne. And the throne is above the seven heavens. He's above the throne. And the throne is above the seven heavens. And they're above the seven earths. So what do you mean he has no location? So you don't believe he's al-arsh, above the thrones? Above <clears throat> the throne, singular. Lord, save me from here. So he's above the throne, right? Yeah. And the throne is above the seven heavens? Yeah. And the uh, seven heavens above the seven flat earths? Because oh. chapter 65 verse 12 says, Allah made seven heavens and the earth the like thereof. Seven earths, seven heavens. So you have seven heavens, seven, I'm sorry, seven earths, Seven heavens, and above the heavens, the throne, and Allah is above the throne. So what do you mean? No location. He's above the throne. So the throne has no location? Mean and why does your God descend to the lower part of the heaven if creation can't contain him? Every third part of the night, he descends to the lowest heaven. If he's omnipresent, why is he descending and asking if there's anyone praying? And creation can't contain him. Can you explain that to me? That's my, during the Tahajjud prayer. That's the what? The, the Tahajjud prayer. Uh, well, that's still, he's descending to the lowest part of the heavens. That's what I'm asking you. Why? Why is he descending to the lower... Lowest part of the heavens. Here, let me get you the hadiths. You ready? I thought you said creation can't contain him. Here it is. Here's the link. Sal Bukhari. I'm going to put it on the screen for everyone. I'll send it to you in the private. Sal Bukhari. Okay. Here you go. So let me post it for you. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out. You said Allah can't be contained, but he has a body. That contains him. And that body needs space. Even though it's unlike anything creation. He's above the throne. And he has to descend into the lowest heaven. That's creation. That means he's entering his creation. Narrated Abu Huraira. Allah's apostle said. Every night. When it is the last third of the night. Our Lord. Notice. Every night. When it is the last third of the night. Our Lord. The superior the blessed. Descends. Goes down. To the nearest heaven. And says. Is there anyone. To invoke me, that I may respond to his invocation? Is there anyone to ask me so that I may grant him his request? Is anyone asking <clears throat> my forgiveness so that I may forgive him? So why does your God enter into the lowest heaven if he can't enter in creation? Mm. Mm. It is descending in a real sense in a manner that benefits his majesty might. You well, better not be ta'wil. You better not. You better not make ta'wil. You better not allegorize this. The salaf did not explain the how. They just accepted what it said. Once you try to explain it, you're no longer salaf salih. You're not following Muhammad's companions, their followers and their followers after them. You're not salafi. So better not explain it. He comes down in a, in a manner suiting his majesty but he really comes down just like he has really he really has two right hands and he's really above the throne so i'm still wondering if creation can't contain him how does he enter creation <clears throat> how does he enter creation because you don't know your own quran and sources you're only going by what they tell you so since your god can enter creation he has a body that <clears throat> contains him and that body requires space I still didn't hear a good answer. If the Quran is Allah's speech that became a book, why can't God's uncreated word become flesh? 
You still didn't explain to me because you didn't give me a good reason. Because he... Says what? And as you're thinking about it, can I ask you another question? Okay. <clears throat> it says he descends... Uh, guys, here's my article on this. and I'm going to get you the article. The article I'm quoting from here it is, and I'll get you another one. It says he descends... At the lowest heaven, at the third part of every night. Now, in some parts of the world, it's day. So what's night for you, it's day for someone else. So when it says he descends at the third part of the heaven, in the third, I'm sorry, in the lowest heaven, third part of the night, which part of the world? Because if it's night in one place, it's day somewhere else. So where does he exactly descend? I know he's omnipresent, but you keep saying he's omnipresent. I will give you 50 million bucks if you quote me a Salafi scholar where they say he's omnipresent. He goes, he is present by his knowledge, not he himself by his that, that meaning essence. His essence is not present everywhere. Why do you keep saying that, dude? But that mm -hmm. can answer the question. According to the Hadith, he descends to the lowest part of the heaven every third part of the night. But if it's night one place, it's daylight somewhere else. So which part of the world does he descend at the third part of the night? Because if it's night in the Netherlands, it's daytime somewhere else. If it's night in Saudi Arabia, it's daytime somewhere else. <clears throat> And you left Jesus, who you don't know for this religion. Amazing. Okay. So think about that one. <clears throat> Go to Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. Ibn Hajar, the commentator on Bukhari. So what did he say? May she quote from Imam Baidawi, which he say, which he says that he, what is intended by the descent is the, is the light of his mercy. And it's no, that the is world. not. That's not the original interpretation of the Salaf. That's a lot later commentary by someone who's influenced by Kalam, philosophy. He doesn't descend by his mercy. He descends himself. So now you're giving me the explanation of later Muslims who come thousands of years, not thousands, I'm sorry, Lord save me from error, hundreds of years later, but that means you're not a Salafi. So just say I'm not a Salafi. And are you saying the mercy is speaking in the lowest heaven? So when Allah says, who is it that will invoke me? Let him invoke me. That's actually the mercy speaking. So now you made a mercy, the mercy of Allah a person. <clears throat> so you just made Allah's mercy a person because you said he descends by his mercy. Well, that means because he's merciful, he comes down. But if you're saying, no, it's his mercy coming down. Well, then you just made his mercy a person, a apostasis, that actually appears and speaks. So if Allah's mercy speaks, are you saying Allah's attributes are actually living persons that are uncreated? So how many persons you have in your Godhead? It's not really that. It's the... Speak closer to the mic, buddy. What was it? It's not really that he's my... It's not really that. It's not really that? What do you mean? Anyway, buddy, your religion is mass confusion. So you claim you believe Allah is one and that you believe in Tawheed. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I just showed you you have, you have problems with your Tawheed, but one problem I have is how can you believe Allah is absolutely one when you believe the Quran is uncreated? That means the Quran has always existed, and yet you have the Quran. <clears throat> it's supposed to be Allah speaking. 
which has Allah either speaking to himself in eternity or the Quran is a divine being that speaks with Allah. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha. And I'm going to give you a hadith where the Quran comes on the day of judgment and debates with Allah. Surah Al-Fatiha, which you have to recite 17 times a day, is uncreated. Right? Maybe. Maybe. It's part of the kalam, the Quran. It's uncreated. Surah Al-Fatiha. This is a prayer. Now I'm going to show you the dilemma. Pay attention because you sound intelligent. This is a prayer that has no beginning. It was there before creation. Chapter 1 of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, I'm going to read it for you what it says. Chapter 1. In the name of God, Allah, the most merciful, the compassionate. Now notice, this is a prayer. Praise belongs to Allah, God. Rabbul Alameen. The Lord of all being. The all merciful, the all compassionate. Who's praying this prayer before creation? Because it's a prayer. Look. Praise belongs to Allah. The Lord of all being. All merciful, all compassionate. The master of the day of doom. Malik Yom Adin, Thee only we serve. To thee alone we pray for secure, for strength. Guide us. Surat al-Mustaqim. The path of those whom thou hast blessed, not of those against whom thou art wrathful, nor of those who are astray. This is a prayer praising Allah and asking Allah for guidance and mercy. And this prayer was there before creation. So who is praying it? Think about your answer so you don't set yourself up. Who is praying it? <clears throat> I mean, the Quran is written in Fiqh al al Akbar by uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. What? Allah's attributes are eternal. They are not speak new. Louder in the mic. Created? Yeah, speak louder in the mic, buddy. Speak louder. It's written in Fiqh al Akbar by Imam Abu Hanifa. <laughs> Allah's attributes are eternal. They are not new or created. Who says the attributes of Allah are not eternal or they are created or. Have doubts regarding them is a disbeliever in Allah, a kafir. The Quran yeah, speaks you Allah. Say it's them. You're just repeating what Abu Hanif written in the heart of. We're not talking about it's written. You just said it's uncreated. Abu Hanif agrees. So that means this prayer was there in eternity. You're just confirming what I just said. So I'm still wondering before creation, who prays this prayer? <clears throat> it was revealed in Mecca. Who cares where it's revealed? I'm talking about before Mecca was created. This prayer, Surah Al-Fatiha, is uncreated because it's Quran. So that means this prayer was there before there was a Mecca, before there was a Medina. Who was praying it in eternity? Who was praying it, man? Come on. <clears throat> You know your God, Allah, recites Quran before there was creation? Your God, Allah, recites Quran before there was creation? <clears throat> Let me show it to you. You ready? So Allah, in creation, in before creation, is reciting Quran. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here you go. Sunnah.com. Here it is. Why is your God Allah reciting Quran when the Quran includes prayers of worship to Allah? So when Allah is reciting Quran, he's praying to himself, worshiping himself. Here it is. Let me show you the hadith. A hadith. Here you go. Let me read it for you. Mishkat al-Masabih, book 8, hadith 39. It's also found elsewhere. But let me just show you so you don't think I'm making it up. And you guys make fun of Christians. Stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. Here you go. And we'll talk about Jesus, whom you don't know why you left him, comparing him to Muhammad. Here you go. Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira. Here it is, right here. So everyone sees it on the screen. Abu Huraira reported God's messenger, Allah's messenger, saying, A thousand years before creating the heavens and the earth, a thousand years before heavens and earth existed, 
Allah recited Taha and Yasin. Taha and Yasin. Okay? He recited chapter 20 of the Quran, Yasin. And when the angels heard the recitation, they said, Happy are a people to whom this comes down. Happy are the minds which carry this, and happy are the tongues which utter this. Darimi transmitted it. So your God, Allah, before heavens and earth existed, thousand years before creation, he's reciting Quran, Taha Yasin. And those surahs, you'll have surahs where Allah is being praised, Allah is being glorified. So Allah is reciting Quran about people who don't exist, events that haven't happened, and praises to himself. So why is Allah reciting Quran where he's going to be speaking to himself, praising himself, invoking himself? What's going on here? Why is your God reciting Quran? Isn't it ibadah when you recite Quran? It's worship, ibadah. Cohen? Yeah. So your your Allah is performing ibadah, worship, because he's reciting Quran. And dude, and you and you guys make fun of Christianity. Stuck for Allah, stuck for Allah. This is also found in, in Tirmidhi, same hadith, Tirmidhi on alam.org. Now they changed, they changed the numbering. It's Tirmidhi hadith 660. Same thing, Nadir Abu Huraira. They keep changing the links, but that's okay. It's online. It's not a lie. Here it is. I'm going to ask you again. So, you became a Muslim following religion that's irrational, and you left Christianity. You did not know. Allah's Messenger said, A thousand years before creating the heavens and the earth, Allah recited Taha and Yasin. And when the angels heard the recitation, said, Happy are the people to whom this comes down. Happy are the minds which carry this, and happy are the tongues which utter this. Darimi, there it is. So, we've established your God Allah performs ibadah because you just admit when you recite Quran, that's ibadah, that's worship. You worship Allah by reciting Quran. And yet Allah's reciting Quran thousand years before creation. So he's performing ibadah. Your Allah has at least two right hands, a left hand, at least three eyes. He has gonads, he has a waist, he wears an izar, a garment, he has a foot, he has a shin. That means he has a body that's uncreated, which means he needs space. And you're telling me your God needs nothing, needs no one, and he's not like you. Well, maybe he doesn't recite like you, but he recites like you. If you recite Quran, he recites Quran. That means he's like you in reciting Quran, but he recites it better. What do you do with the black stone? Because you tell me Tawheed, right? You tell me Tawheed. Okay. So when your prophet made it sunnah, that when you perform Umrah, Hajj, you go to the Kaaba, you have to kiss the black stone and touch it and weep on it if you can, or at least touch it with a stick or symbolize touching with your hand. And then says that the black stone came down. It was white. It became black from the sins of the people kissing it, sons of Adam. And it erases your sin. And on the day of judgment, it will be given two eyes and a tongue to intercede for you. You believe that? You believe the black stone is going to do that for you? Actions will speak up on the day of judgment. It will speak. That's what I'm saying. You believe that? It will speak. It will basically speak up for you on the day of judgment. It will speak what on the day of judgment? It will speak up. Yes, I know. The black stone will speak up for those who kissed it and touched it, right? Right. It means that you're ex you're giving me will. It means that Allah's going to give it. It says eyes and a tongue to speak. I got the hadith. I'll show it to you. It means Allah will make it able to speak so it can defend you. And it says it turned black from the sons of Adam and erases sins. So you're okay with a black stone erasing your sin if you kiss it, touch it, and becoming black because it means it's absorbing your sin and the black stone interceding for you. And what the hell is your problem 
with Jesus in his love, dying on the cross to pay the debt of your sin so you can be forgiven and he's your Shafi, your intercessor? You do with the black stone what we say about Jesus. So you've taken the things Christians say about Jesus and you attribute it to a black stone. What, do you, what religion is this, man? You want me to show you the Hadiths where your black stone comes to life? Okay, let me show it to you and I'll give you the article. Hold on. Right here. Here it is. I'm going to give you the article and then I'm going to give you the Hadiths. So your black stone does what Jesus does. And you guys complain about us. Here it goes. Here is the article. I'm going to give you the a hadith. Guys, this is for you. Save these articles. All right. Here, look what he says. Again, sunnah.com. Sunnah.com. It's great. Hassan. It's good. Hassan. So you don't think I'm lying. And I give the links in my article. Here it goes. So you can see I've sent it to you private and everyone else. Here goes right here. All right. This comes from Sunan Ibn Majah. Sunan Ibn Majah, Hadith 2944. And I gave you the link online to read it. Okay, it's Hassan. It's good. Sa'ad bin Jubair is reported to have said, I heard Ibn Abbas saying that Allah's messenger said, this stone must come on the day of resurrection. It will have two eyes to see with and a tongue to talk with bearing witness for him who caressed it with truth. Hassan, and here's another version, in case you missed it. Jami at tirmidhi Jami at tirmidhi Okay, watch here. So, Hassan, great Hassan, guys. So you can see it. it's in the article. Guys, use this stuff. There you go. There it is for you too. So I'm, I'm wondering... You, you left Jesus for a black stone. Okay. Whatever makes you happy. Jami Tirmidhi. Let me put it on the screen for you. So everyone sees the classification. Hassan. Jami Tirmidhi. Right there. And let's read. And it's it's by Ibn Abbas, by the way. Muhammad's first co cousin whom Allah gave wisdom to know the deen. Because Muhammad prayed for him. So if this man doesn't know your deen, nobody does. Here it is. The book of Hajj, Kitab al-Hajj, what you're supposed to do in Hajj. What has been related about the black stone? Ibn Abbas narrated, Ibn Abbas narrated that the messenger of Allah said about the black stone, Wallah, by Allah, Allah will raise it on the day of resurrection with two eyes by which it sees and a tongue that it speaks with testifying to ever touched it in truth. So the black stone is your intercessor. You okay with that? Mm -mm. You okay with having to kiss a black stone, touch it, caress it, weep on it like your prophet did? And Umar ibn al-Khattab, did he not say when he went to kiss it? He goes, I know you're a stone that neither harms nor benefits anyone. Had I not seen the messenger of Allah kiss you, I would not kiss you. Because Muhammad did it, I do it. So you believe the black stone will erase your sin if you show it love and respect and it will intercede for you. So you believe about the black stone, what we said Jesus did for us. So what is your problem with Christianity? Why did you leave it when you don't know it? You want us to follow this? I mean, we're basically forgiven with actions like prayer, fasting. Okay, so then why kiss the black stone and why have it come and defend you? Mm, we even get forgiven by wudu. Yeah, but you didn't answer my question. Why then kiss the black stone and why did it become black from the sons of the, the sins of the sons of Adam? And why does it erase sin? Why then do all of that if wudu and prayer forgives your sins? So then why add this? Why are you doing what the pagans did? Didn't the pagans say the same thing to Muhammad? In chapter 39 verse 3 it says, We only serve these idols, and they had stones, black stone is one of them, so they can bring us closer to Allah. That's exactly what the black stone is doing. It's bringing closer to Allah. 
So then why Muhammad kiss it, touched it, wept on it, if everything else can forgive your sins? So why do this? And why does it come to life to intercede for you? Why then? Why then? Because you just said, wudu, you know, erase this sin when you put water in your mouth. That's washing your mouth of sin. Okay. Prayer. Okay. So then if these are remove your sin, why add this? So that even Omar ibn al-Khattab can say, I know you're a stone that neither harms nor benefits. Had I not seen the Messenger of Allah kiss you, I would not kiss you. So then why do this? This is idolatry. And yet you say, Tawheed, Ahad, Ahad. And again, I'm asking you, why is the black stone doing for you what we Christians said Jesus does for us? And why do you have a problem with Jesus and his love doing that for us? But you don't have a problem with a black stone doing it for you. So you didn't answer that question. Go on. And by the way, you said wudu, right? Yeah, wudu. Okay. Do you know why you wake up in the morning and you're supposed to put water in and out of your nose three times? You do that, right? Yeah. Do you know why? Because my mouth is dirty. No, in your nose. Why do you snort water in and out of your nose three times? Because it's filthy. It's because it's dirty. No, because Muhammad said Satan sleeps in your nose. You're flushing shaitan out of your nose. Here, let me show you that. You didn't even know that? They didn't tell you that? They didn't tell you that? Here it is. It's one of the ways to... It's what? One of the ways to one's mind and thoughts. Satan no, was... it says Satan is in your nose. It didn't say you're cleansing evil thoughts. Here it is. Sal Bukhari. You can try to explain it to you want. I'm just telling you what your prophet said. Your prophet said this. So if you want to tell me your prophet doesn't know how to explain the deen, you're making your own interpretation. Sal Bukhari, book 59, hadith 104 in English is volume 4, book 54, hadith 516. I gave you the link. I, did I give you guys the link too? Here, let me get. Yeah, I did. Now here, let's read. So I'm gonna have to ask you a question. Okay. To, here it goes. I'm gonna put that deeth right here. Read. Narin Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, if any one of you rouses from sleep and performs the ablution, he should wash his nose by putting water in it and then blowing it out thrice, three times, because Satan, Satan, has stayed. In the upper part of his nose all night. You're flushing out Satan from your nose. So Satan's in your nose. You know that, right? I already, already clarified it. You, well, how do you clarify it? You're telling me you're explaining it better than your prophet? No, it's not, uh, I take from scholars. What? Again, listen to what you're telling me. Your prophet, who's supposed to explain the deen, he could have said, you are flushing water in nose because you're cleansing the dirt in your nose. He could have said that because no one speaks better than any prophet. But then your scholars come and then they're telling you what he means. So they're explaining Muhammad's explanation of the practices. And that's some scholars. Not every scholar says that. Many scholars say, we should believe this. We may not understand it. We should believe it. Here, let me give you an example. So, again, don't give me your scholars. I gave you Muhammad. Stick with Muhammad, not scholars, because not all scholars agree, because the same scholars will tell you, no, Allah's hands, they're not literal. Hands means power. Eyes means he sees. So why are you appealing to scholars when I'm giving you your prophet? Let me show you what the, uh, what the narration says here. The commentator, the translator, I'm sorry, Bukhari, Muhammad Muskhan Khan. The translator of Bukhari, this hadith, look what he says. Here it is. The footnote, if you get the hard copy of his translation of Sal Bukhari, he says this. The footnote to this particular hadith states, we should believe that Satan actually stays in the upper part of one's nose. Though we cannot perceive how, for this is related to the unseen world of which we know nothing except what Allah tells us through his messenger. 
So you're telling me some scholars, other scholars say they're lying. The prophet says he's in our nose. We accept it. Allahu Adam. So why are you explaining it away? Why are you explaining it away? So I'm going to ask you a question since your prophet says Satan is in the nose. All Muslims, if they're devout Muslim, must get up in the morning and perform wudu if they're faithful Muslims. And all Muslims must put water in and out of their nose three times, correct? Yeah. So does that mean Satan is in all of your noses? Is he in my nose too? So if I don't perform wudu, he stays in my nose, and then he's in your nose, and he's in your mother's nose, and my sister's nose, and my daughter's nose, and he's in the nose of everyone? Is that what you believe? Like I said, it means that he puts filthy thoughts in your mind. You're, you're not following me, buddy. He's in my nose. So you're saying in my nose, he's putting filthy thoughts. Okay. But that means he's in everyone's noses. Your nose, your mother's nose, your sister's nose, my sister's nose, my daughter's nose. Man, this Satan's very powerful. And how does water flush him out? Water is physical. Satan also, he's physical, so he can be flushed out by water. And why three? Why not two? Why not four? You left a Jesus you don't know for this stupid religion. When are you going to come back, dude? You made a mistake. You made a mistake. You know that. I mean, come on. Be honest. You made a mistake. And you clearly believe Muhammad is al insan al kamil a better example than Jesus? And he's the perfect man. He's, he's the yeah. perfect man. And he's an example for you to emulate. And he is a better example than Jesus. The Jesus you read about in the Gospels. Even a better example than Paul? You seriously believe this? In light of what your own ahadith said your prophet did? See, for us, Jesus is the standard as you read the Gospels. We look at Jesus and his life, and we even see the life of his followers like Paul, whom you guys don't accept. Then you come and tell us Muhammad is al-insan al-kamil, the perfect man. Sayyid al mursaleen the master of the sent ones, and the leader of the sons of Adam. And then we look at his life and see how disgusting it is. You actually left this beautiful Jesus for this man? Because you know as a Sunni Muslim, you know you can't lie to me. You know you can't lie to me. No, Jennifer, he understands me. He's getting it. You know that you believe that your prophet married a nine-year-old. You know that, right? Yes. Say it again. He married a nine-year-old. See, this is why I like you. You're honest. That's why I think you're going to come to the truth. Be honest before God who looks at your heart. You really are okay, honestly, from your heart. Because if we go by the timing, he would have been 54 years old when he slept with Aisha, who was playing with dolls. And Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, whom you quote, in his commentary on why Aisha was still playing with dolls, even at the time of Khaybar, she was around 14. Because dolls, images are forbidden except for children. He says that Aisha was allowed to play with dolls even up until 14 because that's when she reached puberty. She reached puberty at 14. That means he married her when she didn't reach puberty at 9. Then when he died, she was 18. And he left her a widow because you can't marry his wives. Tell me before God who sees your heart, whom you're going to give an answer to, you are okay that a 54-year-old man took a nine-year-old playing with dolls and on a swing, nine, to his bed, had sex with her. And according to Ibn Hajar al and the scholars, she didn't even become pubescent until she was 14 because she could play with dolls until she was 14. And then he left her a widow at 18. And you are okay with this for the love of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God? Be honest with me, man. Don't lie. Don't put on a show. You're okay with this? In the narration of Sayyid Bukhari, she reached puberty when her parents... You ignored everything I said. No. Bukhari uses Aisha as an example of 65 verse 4, that she wasn't pubescent. And Ibn Hajar al-Asqamani says, 
She was playing with dolls until the age of 14 because that's when she reached puberty. Did you hear what I said? I have your sources, buddy. He later says that his view was questionable. She was what? His view was questionable. Who cares his view? Bukhari uses Aisha, marriage at nine, and as an example of chapter 65, verse 4, at talaq where you can marry girls who haven't had puberty, monthly cycles, and divorce them. The idda of girls, the idda of girls who have not menstruated yet. When you marry a girl who hasn't had her period and you divorce her after having sex, how long does she wait? 65 verse 4. Bukhari gives. Aisha is an example of that girl. Let me get it for you. So you didn't answer the question. Even if she reached puberty at nine, you're still thinking a nine-year-old? who had her period, is still mature for a 54-year-old man to have sex with her? Are you kidding me, right? But let me get you the hadith because, again, you didn't uh, listen. And I'm going to show you a picture of what a nine-year-old looks so you can sink in. Hold on, let me get it for you. Let me get Bukhari. Let me go there. All right, one second. Just let me pull it up for you. So as I pull it up for you, even if she's uh, puberty, you're saying a girl who has period at nine, she's still psychologically, physically mature for a grown man old enough to be her grandfather to have sex with her? Is that what you're saying? <clears throat> Is that what you're saying, brother? Can no. you mind it? She was definitely mature. She was definitely pubescent. She was mature at nine, playing with dolls. At nine, playing with dolls, she was mature. I mean, yes. Oh, you are sick. You are really a son of the devil. You, now you proved you're a son of the devil. You're sick. That's okay. May God save you, because God can save save you from your sins. You guys heard this, right? And this guy's from the Netherlands. This guy's from the Netherlands. This is what Islam does to the brain of people. He goes, yes. So if you had a nine-year-old daughter, you'd be okay with a 54-year-old man sleeping with her? I mean, that was the age of consent back then. No, it wasn't. That's a lie. You're lying to me. Because your own traditions say that when Abu Bakr and Umar wanted to marry Fatima, Muhammad says... To them, she's too young, even though she would have been 11 and 12. And then when Umar ibn al-Khattab wanted to marry Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Ali, she was around 11, and Ali says she's too young for you. Are you lying to me again? I don't know. Maybe you don't know your religion, so I'll give you benefit of doubt. Do you know this and you're lying, or you don't know this? <clears throat> I have not heard that hadith. Okay. I have them all and lined up. But I just want to get you where... I want to get you where Bukhari says 65. Just let me get it for you. So point being, are you okay if you had a nine-year-old daughter for a 54-year-old man to have sex with her? I mean, nowadays, no. But isn't Muhammad an example for all people at all times? So you're saying Muhammad was stuck in the 7th century? Age of consent changed over time. But doesn't Allah know? That age of consent will change. And doesn't Allah know it's more merciful that those girls don't get me at that age? I thought he knows everything. So why did he change it like he changed adoption? And did he not change adoption? A, a woman must be mature and she must know. No, she, no, that's your brother. Stop lying to me. Your scholars, even Nawawi and others say no. The only thing she needs to be mature is she can handle penetration. If a girl can handle penetration, that's when you can have sex with her. But until then, you can play with her and rub her with your penis. This is your dean. This is your dean. Mature in Islam doesn't mean, mature in Islam doesn't mean that, oh, she's psychologically mature. And that physiologically, she is, her body has matured to handle. It means that you can fully penetrate her private part 
without hurting her and causing her extreme pain, less pleasure. That's what your scholar said. That's the condition. That's why they say you can have sex with her before nine, but if it's too much pain, wait till she's nine, and then you can deflower her. This is your dean. This is what your scholars say, like Noah and others. I have the rec records. I just want to get you, you know. The, the article, one second. So I still didn't, didn't hear an answer from you. You kept talking about it's okay back then. Are you, you okay? You okay? With a man, with a man, you. Then ask about back then. Are you okay with a man taking your nine-year-old? He's 50 four years old and having sex with her if you had a nine-year-old daughter. <clears throat> Are you okay with that? If she's mature. Oh, so you are okay with that. Wow. Damn, bro. Okay, you guys heard it. The guy's sick. You see what Islam does to people? All right. I'm glad you said it. I want people to hear it. This is, and this guy's from the Netherlands on top of it. Stuck for Allah. Damn, man. Hold on one second. Let me get this for you. Let me do this. I'm glad you said it. At least people can hear and see what you just said. Here. Let me do this. I'm going to have to get you. And you, you're okay. All right. Okay. So since you're okay with that, are you okay? If the Muslims attack, if there's a jihad, if there is a jihad and the Muslims come and attack your place and they take your woman captive, your mother captive, your sister captive, your daughter captive and have sex with them and then sell them off. Are you okay with that? This is Aisha Buley's translation of Sal Bukhari. Unfortunately, it went offline, but we're using archive.com. Let me show you what ayah of the Quran Bukhari used to show that Aisha was not, she had not reached puberty. Okay, guys, I just gave you the link. Archive.com. Unfortunately, she took this down, but Archive has it. So you got the link, guys, everybody? Let me get you the link. Here it is again. The link. For everyone, I thought I sent it. You got it, right? So here it is for you guys. This is what Islam does to European minds. This guy's he's not even Arab. Lord have mercy. Save us, Lord, from these people. They're dangerous. If this guy ends up becoming a terrorist, he's going to come and behead you and rape your women. This guy. The guy I'm talking to right here because of Allah and his messenger. Don't be surprised he ends up in Syria or Iraq and they catch him and you're going to see him on the news. Okay, here you go. Bukhari. Bukhari, okay? This okay. is the, the subheading of Bukhari translated by Aisha Buley. What example does he give of a girl who hasn't had her menstruation periods, who has been married, has sex, and has been divorced? Look at the example he gives. Or, yeah, Bukhari gets translated by Aisha Buley. A man giving his young children marriage. By the words of Allah, look what Bukhari quotes. By the words of Allah, that also applies to those who have not yet menstruated. Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 4. And he made the idda, the waiting period of a woman who's had sex, of a girl before puberty, three months. Do you see what the ayah is talking about? A girl who hasn't reached puberty, her idda, waiting period, after she's been married, had sex, is three months. Now, who is the example of such a woman? Here you go. It is related from Aisha that the Prophet married her when she was six years old and consummated it when she was nine, and she was the wife for nine years. Bukhari gave you, Bukhari gave you Aisha as an example of the ayah of the Quran of girls who haven't had their periods. So did you know this or you were lying to me? Mm. Or you didn't know this? Did you know this? 
I have not seen this post anywhere. What? This this hadith from Bukhari, I've seen it that when her when the Prophet married her when she was six and years and and she consummated her marriage at nine. And did you read the ayah that Bukhari gave? I've not seen show... it. Anywhere. What? I've not seen it anywhere. Okay, but I just gave it to you. Did you click on the link? Here's another one. This is Aisha Buley's translation of Bukhari. Here's the other one. There it is, the link, buddy. So there it is. I gave you. Here's the other one for they're all of you. Here's the other one. Okay. Okay. So I'm not making it up. It's right there. This is in Bukhari. Aisha Buley translated with the subheadings. Here's what you're going to find if you look in that link. This is what you're going to find. Okay. Here you go. Uh huh. This is from Kitab al Tafsir. Okay, watch here. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Two of them, huh? And in both cases, when explaining the application of 65 verse 4, Bukhari gives Aisha as an example. Here. Tafsir of Surah Al Talaq, Mujahid said that if you have any doubt, that's Ayah 4 of Surah Al Talaq, means if you do not know whether she menstruates or not. The idda of women who do not who do not longer menstruate and those who have not yet menstruated is three months. Okay, three months. And who's the example? Let me show you the example. Here it is. This is what I just gave you. There, right here. Here it is. The example. Who's the example of this Bukhari? Aisha. Yep. A man giving his young children marriage by the words of Allah that also applies to those who have not yet menstruated and he made the end of a girl before puberty three months. It didn't go through. Darn it. Hold on. Why didn't it go through? See, this is giving me our time. Hold on. Here it is. 48. What the heck happened? It didn't go through yet, right? Anyway. Here it is. Aisha. Why didn't it go through? Sometimes it doesn't go through. So here it is, the one I gave you originally. This is part of that. So it's ready for Aisha that the prophet married her when she was six years old and consummated when she was nine, and she was his wife for nine years. So in Surah Al Talaq and the Kitab Al Tafsir of Bukhari, he says this refers to girls who haven't had their periods, they're young. Then here in this section of Bukhari, mentioning these words, Again, 65 verse 4, in Kitab al-Nikah, Kitab al-Nikah, he quotes the ayah again and gives Aisha as an example. So in Bukhari, in Kitab al-Tafsir, he says that ayah 4 of Surah al-Talaq means young girls who are too young who haven't had periods. You can have sex with them, divorce them, they remarry. Then in Kitab al-Nikah, the ayah is mentioned again, 65.4. Again, young girls who haven't had their periods, who can be married, have sex, and be divorced. And in there, Kitab al Nikah, he gives Aisha as an example of a young girl who hadn't had her period because she hadn't reached puberty. Also, so, this here, here talks about some women. Like, so can hear you. Young women. Like. And pregnant women. So that's why the person was sent down. You gotta speak in the mic. Come to the mic. Speak. Some women were not mentioned in the Quran. The old women, young women, and pregnant women, according to Ibn Kathir. No, Ibn Kathir, I have him here. Okay. Ibn Kathir, I have what he says about 65 4 and about Aisha. I have Ibn Kathir, buddy. Here's the what well, here's the link where we quote Ibn Kathir and the scholars on 65 verse 4 and what he says about Aisha as well in another article of mine. But here, let me show you. Ibn Kathir, what do you say about Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 4? Okay, you said Ibn Kathir, right? Everyone heard you. Here you go. Ibn Kathir, here you go. His explanation of Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 4. Here it is. You said Ibn Kathir, right? Everyone heard you. Yes. And stay close to the mic when you talk. Here you go. 
This is Ibn Kathir, everybody. Allah, the exalted, clarifies the waiting period of the woman in menopause, those who have gotten too old. And that is the one whose menstruation has stopped due to her older age. Her idda is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those with who menstruate, which is based upon the ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. This, now watch. The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. This applies also to the young who haven't even had their periods because they're young. Their idda is three months like those in menopause. Why are you appealing to Ibn Kathir when he's saying your deen allows you to this day to have sex with young girls, premature minors who haven't had their periods? By the way, we also talk about primary amenorrhea. Do you want me to read what he just said, that these are girls who haven't had their periods? One more time. Okay. Are you being demonized here that you don't have a problem with this? So is this ayah abrogated? No. Say it again. No. Okay, you heard it, right? This guy from the Netherlands. So in Afghanistan and in Syria, where you have a Muslim majority, let's see if you really fear Allah and not man. Can you then take... A girl who is premature, who hasn't had her periods, 9, 8, 10, marry her and have sex with her and divorce her, according to this ayah? Say it. Don't be, uh, you fear Allah, right? Say it. Be man enough. No. Oh, so the ayah is abrogated. No, it's not. But, but so Afghanistan. In Muslim land. Those are the countries, I mean... Speak, speak in the mic, buddy. Speak in the mic. I mean, but they don't really represent Islam. I didn't ask you, but I'm asking where you have a Muslim land, they want to implement Sharia, and they want to implement the Quran, Surah Al-Talaq, Ayah 4. According to the Ayah, this is what I'm asking you, listen to my question. Can I, if I'm living in a Muslim land, not America, where I'll be thrown in jail? In America, I'll be thrown in jail. In a land where it's majority Muslim and they want to implement Sharia according to Quran and Sunnah or the Madahib. Okay, listen to my question. If I'm living in Syria or in Afghanistan where I know they're trying to follow Sharia, they don't do it perfectly. Okay, we get it. According to this ayah of the Quran, if I take a nine-year-old, ten-year-old, who is premature, who hasn't had her periods, and I marry and have sex with her. According to this ayah, am I okay? <clears throat> By the way, you could also talk about uh, primary amenorrhea. Okay. Can I repeat my question, what the ayah says? Can you show me that what you just said is in the ayah? Menorrhea, primary menorrhea? Primary Did amenorrhea. Woman can be physically mature and young at the same time. Yeah. Mature enough at nine, who hasn't had her periods to have a grown man stick his penis in her, right? You know you're sick. You know that, right? You have her period? No. The ayah says they haven't had their periods. Are you lying in the name of your God? Do you want me to read the ayah again? And the commentaries, the mufassirun? Do you want me to read Ibn Kathir and Jalalain and Tabari and Qurtubi? Dude, it's right in front of me. I gave you the article. And we have the Arabic too. Can you answer the question honestly? Why are you ashamed of Allah and his messenger? I literally just quoted Ibn Kathir. I just quoted Ibn Kathir. Here it is again, guys. Here it is again, Ibn Kathir. One more time. Guys, one more time. Ibn Kathir, one more time. Ibn Kathir, Allah the Exalted, clarifies the waiting period of the woman in the menopause. And that is the one whose menstruation has stopped due to her old age. Her idda is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those who menstruate, which is based upon the ayah, Surah Al-Baqarah. The same for the, listen, this is Ibn Kathir, the same for the young who have not, I'm going to say it loud so my neighbors can hear who have not yet reached the years of menstruation. 
Their idda is three months, like those in menopause. This is the second time I gave you Ibn Kathir. You want me to give you Tabari, Qurtubi? Who else you want me to give you? Here, let me give you someone else, because I gave you Ibn Kathir. Here, Tafsir Jalalain. Jalalain. And I'm going to give you Razi, and I'm going to give you Qurtubi. On this ayah, Surah Al-Talaq, ayah 4. Here. One more time. This is the two Jalals. Jalalain. And as for those of your women who read, or you can read, there are two variants. Birat. No longer expect to menstruate if you have any doubts about their waiting period. Their prescribed waiting period shall be three months. Now watch. Listen. And also for those who have not yet menstruated. Why? Because of their young age. Young age. That's why they haven't had their periods. Their period should also be three months. Both cases apply to other than those whose spouses have died. For these, those whose spouses died, their period is prescribed in the verse. They shall wait for themselves for four months and ten days. Okay. No, wait. Before you comment, let me give you some more because no matter what I give you, it's not enough. Okay. Qurtubi. Tafsir al-Qurtubi. Tafsir al-Qurtubi. Okay. Do you get it now or can I ask a question for you to answer? Okay. Okay. So what, let me just read Qurtubi one more. I got a lot. This is Qurtubi. And those who have not yet menstruated, meaning the young girl. The word Asakhira denotes a girl who did not reach the age of puberty yet. Are you satisfied? Or do you want me to give you 10 more? That the ayah says, you Muslim can marry a young girl who hasn't had her period because she is premature minor, you can still marry and have sex with her and divorce her if you're not pleased with her. Okay, so I'm asking you, is this verse abrogated or it's still binding? It's not abrogated. I mean, the ruling still can. Come to the mic. Come closer. Come to the mic. I mean, the ruling still stands. Say it again. Louder. The ruling still stands. And you're laughing? And you're laughing about it? Maybe. See, he's laughing. Get closer to the mic. Okay. The guy's laughing about it. And you're okay with this? <clears throat> and then uh, no, so in the Quran, my four for six says my, my no, that has nothing to do with marriage. I know it's right. about the orphans. No, you just created a contradiction in the Quran. Okay, but you're laughing at this. Maybe. Maybe. Right. So you're okay with this? So then, you just talk about primary minoria. It's what? Oh, here we go again. Okay, so now let's go to 424. Are you okay if the jihadis attack your place? If you're in jihad. Well, maybe because you want to be a jihadi. I don't know. Okay, so imagine the Muslims, they have a khalif, and now they expand Islam, they attack the Netherlands. They attack the Netherlands. And then they take your mother captive, your wife captive, your sister captive. And according to Surah An-Nisa 424, and I'm going to give you the hadith, they can have sex with those women and sell them. Are you okay if the Muslims took your mother captive, your wife captive, and had sex with them and sold them? Would you be okay with that? No, I would not condone it. Speak louder. In the mic. I, would not, I do not condone it. You will not condone what your God says in the Quran? You will not condone what your God says in the Quran, and we also must pay our slave, uh, the, pay them our meher. What? We also must pay them meher. No, four twenty-four is has nothing to do with marriage and giving mahar dawra. It's talking about what is lawful sex and what's unlawful. It says forbidden for you are married women except 
those whom your right hands possess, meaning those you've taken in captivity. And there is sound ahadith, Muslim, Dawood, that says this took place at Autas, when the jihadis attacked the place, they found beautiful women whose husbands were alive, but they don't want to have sex with them. The ayah came down saying, you can have sex with them. This is not about marriage. This is about, can you have sex with a married woman? No, unless you've taken her captive. So are you okay with that? Mm, I do not condone it. You don't, I know you don't condone it, but you're a Muslim. So you're telling Allah what he can and cannot do? That's not what I said, dude. Okay, let's see if it didn't say that. Okay, so you just said it didn't say that. Okay, good. I'm glad you're saying this because you're going to give me more opportunity to show why this religion is dangerous. And you need to repent, come back to Christ, but they need to throw you in jail because you're dangerous to the Netherlands. Here, you said it didn't say that, right? Okay. He said it didn't say that, dude. All right, let's see. Okay, let's make my date. It didn't say that. All righty then. Okay, watch here. Chapter 4, verse 24, Hilali Khan. 424, Hilali Khan. Here it is, and I'm going to give you the hadith, and I'm going to give you the link. And forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. Now let's see what your prophet said. Your prophet, not you. Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim. What did his prophet say? Okay, he said, that's not what it says, dude. All right. Here's the link for all of you. Here's the link for all of you. There you go. Okay. Now you ready? Chapter 9. Here you go. The subheading. So let me going to see if you're going to say if that's not, not what it says. Okay. Here you go. Chapter 9. It is permissible to have intercourse with a female captive after it is established that she's not pregnant. And if she has a husband... Then her marriage is annulled when she is captured. You guys catch it? You are permitted. You can have sex with a captive if she's not pregnant. And if she's married, you taking her captive destroys the marriage. Okay, now let's see the hadith. All right. Because you said, no, that's not what it says, dude. All right, I guess you know more than Allah and his messenger. Here you go. I'm going to post it here on the screen. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri reported that at the Battle of Hanayn, Allah's Messenger sent an army to Autas and encountered the enemy and fought with them, having overcome them and taken them captives. The companions of Allah's Messenger seemed to refrain from having intercourse with the captive women because of their husbands being polytheists. Then Allah Most High sent down regarding that this verse. Meaning, no, you can have sex with them. Here it is. So do I need to give you more? This is Sahih Muslim. Okay. I gave you the link. Here, just in case you missed it. This ayah came down. Surah 424. And women already married, except those whom your right hands possess, i.e. they were lawful for them when their idda period came to them to make sure they're not pregnant, right? Okay, mm -hmm. in case you missed what this was, Sahih Muslim. So you're going to tell me it's not what it's saying? Or are you going to take that back? As long as you seek them. With speak the both in the mic. Speak in the mic. As long as you seek them with your wealth in, mar in legal marriage. Not in front of, in front it didn't of say that, dude. Oh, no. You can sell them. Uh, you want me to give you the hadith where it says you can sell the captive women that you've taken captive and raped? Give those you've consummated marriage to with their due dowries. Let's try this again. Maybe my English is not good. The ayah and the ahadith do not say what you said. These are captive women. You have sex and then you can sell them, it says. I'm going to give you the hadith. But let's go with what you said. Okay, let's agree what he said. So you're saying, I can take a married woman captive and by taking her captive, even though her husband's alive, I can still make her my wife to hell with her husband. If she accepts your mahr, if you pay, even if you pay, okay, I pay her mahr. Hey, yo, we just killed your family, we just looted your village, we just took your husband captive. But I want you for me. Here's the mahr. I'm not going to marry you so I can rape you. 
So that you you're saying that's okay. I mean, if for for sake of uniting tribes. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. So if someone comes, the Jaris attack your village. They take your mother and your father, and your mother's gonna be, oh yeah, I'm excited. You just attacked the Netherlands. You slaughtered so many people. You not took me captive and my husband. Sure, give me the mahar, and then screw me like a whore in the name of Allah's messenger. You know you're sick. You know that, right? You know you're demonized, right? You're dangerous, right? Because this is what Allah's messenger do to people like you, and you're in the Netherlands. This is what makes it scary. This is Islam for you guys. This is Islam. Okay, well, I'm glad this is recorded and you said you're from the Netherlands. But coming back to the issue, why did you leave Christianity that you did not know? Did you know anything about Christianity? I mean, some of it. You got to come close to the mic, friend. This is five times I told you. Come close to the mic. Okay. Did you know anything about Christianity? I've known some parts of it. And so... You didn't study Christianity up to see how beautiful Jesus is, and you left Islam? You left Christianity for Islam? Uh, actually, yes. Okay. And you're okay with that? Yeah. So you're okay. So if I show you that Muhammad is on the feet of Jesus and Jesus is better than Muhammad, will that make you come back? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. So what is your problem with the Christian understanding of Jesus? Because... In Islam, you can have whatever you desire in a paradise. Oh, so you mean having God filling you with his love, joy, and peace and seeing God is not enough because you need whores to deflower in paradise. Is that what you want? I mean, men desire women, so... I see. So God can't change your desire in paradise to desire him and be satisfied in him. He has to give you firm breasted women, women with huge tits for you to the flower. So let's talk about that. You are looking forward for paradise where you're going to have all these whores because the word hur, huri, it's a Persian word where we get the word whore from. <clears throat> so you can deflower them forever? The men desire women. Yeah, I know that, buddy. So you're desiring the whores of paradise so you can deflower them? I mean, I guess. You guess. So you're okay with your God saying he's going to create, he's created actually, these special hoodies, whores whose tits are huge, whom you're going to deflower with eternal erections, according to Hadith? Mm, yeah. Yeah, you're okay with that. Okay. I will tell you, man. All right, man. We're, I'm thinking you're a troll. You can't be really a Muslim. You really are Muslim? Yeah. You sure? 100%. 100%? So say the Shahada. Come to the mic and say the Shahada. Say that last part slowly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you said it. Okay. Because you're so honest, it's shocking me. This is why I'm honest. I'm, I'm, I'm like shocked. You're so honest that uh, you're shocking me. So either you are a Muslim pretending to be a convert and you're just having fun, which is okay because this shows us how evil Islam is. So we're actually the one laughing. Or you did convert and you're okay with all this. So when Jesus tells you, that in the age to come, there will be ne neither marriage nor be given in marriage. Because the joy you're going to experience is the infinite love, joy, and peace of God. Because there's no greater pleasure and joy than seeing God in the glory, filling you to overflowing. You'd replace that for big-breasted whores, whores with huge tits, so you can deflower. <clears throat> so Maybe. what would take you to come back to Christ? What What is it that would take? Because I don't know. Well, where I can, Because you've been honest about your religion being sick and perverted and your God is an embodied, finite being and he worships like Muslims do. So what, so what would it take you to come back to Christ? 
if I can see one Bible verse that says I can have whatever I want in heaven. Yeah, then that means that you're you're just joking. Okay, friend. Yeah, because God is your slave and you're his master and he exists to make you happy. But anyway, good talking to you, buddy. All right? Okay. We'll talk later. So take care. Okay, see ya. Take care, buddy. All right, guys. That was it. All right, guys. I'm coming back live a little later. Lord willing. Yeah, here you go. Maybe he was a troll. Maybe he's a Muslim, but that's okay. He admitted, basically, his religion is filthy. So don't think it's a waste. It wasn't a waste because he gave me opportunity to expose how filthy Islam is. So maybe he was a Muslim or maybe he was a revert. Either way, the Lord Jesus Christ got glorified because Muhammad got exposed. Now, Lord willing, in two hours, I'm live. Lord willing, pray for me. I had thought I scheduled it at the right time, but it turned out I scheduled it a.m. But here it is. Here's the link. Lord willing, I'll be back in two hours. So let's make that session go viral. Glory to God. The numbers increase for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. David, if you want Q&A, the more you want it, the more I'm going to delay Q&A. So in two hours, Lord willing, I'm live, where I'm going to talk about the Father speaking to the Son in Old Testament text, affirming Father and Son are both truly God, and that Muhammad is not mentioned in Isaiah 29, 12. So pray for me. Pray for my health. Ask the Lord to give my daughters and I miraculous safety, security, protection. Give me the discipline to stay healthy and fit. Not to become obese again, to deliver me from food addiction, laziness, slothfulness, keep me pure, sexually pure, to love Jesus and keep pure until the Lord calls me or if I get married, his will be not. And the Lord provide for my daughters and I to do the work of the Lord and he brings them to me and I see them grow up to be godly women. Name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Father have mercy, Son of God have mercy, Holy Spirit have mercy. Here's the link. Two hours from our Lord willing. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahuwah, God Almighty in the flesh, the heart of the Father, the eternal loving companion of the Holy Spirit, our Lord, our God and Savior. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We need you. Save us from our flesh, from Satan and the world, to glorify you, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And remain faithful till we die, until you return. May you return sooner than later and bring my daughters to me. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Lord willing, Lord willing, see you in two hours, less than two hours. Take care.